Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, we're back again, and uh, uh, this week we're going to um, uh, uh, conduct a, a few lectures that tries to reinforce some of the ideas that we uh, discussed uh, during last week. Uh, so a couple of these lectures are going to uh, go at a little bit slower pace and try and um, explain in a little bit more detail uh, some of the concepts that were introduced. Uh, it's my experience that if you don't understand these ideas now uh, and uh, understand how they're used, uh, then the course just gets more complicated and uh, less less well defined as it progresses. So it's kind of important to uh, to uh, pay attention to these lectures. They they may seem uh, simple and uh, um, not as uh, interesting as some of the things we discussed last week, but nonetheless, it's important to understand these concepts. So to, in today's lecture, we're going to. Uh, to uh, discuss in a very general way what a probability distribution is and try to convince you uh, some fundamental uh, issues regarding these probability distributions. Um, the reason we want to do this is that in the previous lecture uh, we stated that this wave function that solves Schrodinger's equation doesn't represent anything real because it's an imaginary uh, function. And it's only the square of the wave function that uh, has a physical meaning. And we went on to describe the probability that a wave function is between x minus dx by 2, right? Um, and x plus dx by 2, we said that the probability that that particle is localized in that region of space is given by the square of the wave function times the width delta x of the region in space that you're interested in, in uh, 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 localizing the particle. So since the wave function psi is a complex number, uh, the magnitude of that wave function squared is just always given by psi star psi, where psi star is the complex conjugate of whatever the wave function psi is. And then we went on to define something called a probability density, which is a derived concept. It's a, it's a defined uh, concept. We said that the probability density was just the uh, psi star psi. And from this previous discussion, it implies that this probability density is the probability that you find a particle at a, at a particular point x divided by this quantity delta x, which which specifies how tightly around x that you're interested in looking. So today's, uh, this first lecture today is, uh, is about uh, probability density and it tries to uh, convey to you some of the fundamental um, of, um, uh, properties of a probability distribution and a probability density. I will also mention that these topics are going to come back when we get to the statistical physics part of modern physics, and that'll be in about six weeks from now. So we'll come back and, uh, and discuss these probabilities, probability f distributions and probability densities uh, once again as the course progresses. So uh, let's set up a... Um, a premise and let's talk our way through it and uh, let's make sure that we understand this very simple example because if we, if we understand this simple example then uh, the uh, extension to quantum mechanics is a pretty straightforward uh, uh, exercise. So the, the premise here is I, I asked the question what is the average height of a Purdue student and I ask you to think how you might measure that average height. Well, clearly it's going to involve measurements. So what we're going to do is we're going to need to uh, uh, track down a bunch of Purdue students and we're going to line them up and we're going to measure their height on some chart. And um, the, uh, the heights that we measure are, are then going to be binned, okay? They're going to be uh, 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 sorted out into ranges of heights uh, which have a uh, 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 a, a well-defined difference between them. So, for instance, uh, 
we might define m bins of height, which each height of an individual student is then categorized into or sorted into. And at the end of the day, we might have 10 or 15 bins of heights, and we might have n1, n2, n3, all the way up to nm occurrences of students who have a height between, let's say, H3 and H4, right? So there would be N3 students that would have this range of heights from our measurements. And then if we wanted to measure, or if we wanted to calculate the average height of a Purdue student, what we would end up doing is something like shown in these equations. We would take the, uh, the uh, uh, height of, of each bin, this would be the center of this range between H sub M and H sub M minus one, we would take that height, we would multiply it by the number of occurrences or the number of students uh, that we measured whose height fell into that range, right? And then we would divide that by the total number of students that we measured. That would be the denominator. And that would then give us the average height of the student. Well, if we, uh, if we agree ahead of time that we measure, let's say, a thousand students, then N, capital N, is going to be a thousand, and we end up having to evaluate the summation based on this particular table right here, right? And that number would then represent uh, our best estimate for the average height of a Purdue student. So uh, once we have that table of numbers, it's, it's uh, often useful to uh, plot a histogram Right, and uh, that histogram is a binned distribution, right, which I show in the top part of this slide. It, it, it plots the number of students that happen to have a height between, let's say, 1.2 and 1.3 meters, or between 1.3 and 1.4 meters, right? And in this particular example that we worked out, uh, let's say we, we, we measure a thousand students. So the total number of students in the, in the measurement is a thousand, right? So this is the, this is, this is the, the probability distribution of heights of students at Purdue. And, um, if we sum up the area under this probability distribution, what we're going to get is just the total number of students that we measured. Okay. Uh, that is sometimes not um, a useful uh, uh, figure of merit for probability distributions. Uh, very often you want the uh, fractional probability distribution plotted as a function of height. And to get to the fractional probability distribution, all we have to do is divide each term in this sum by the total number of students that were measured. And uh, that then converts this axis from total number of students measured to a fractional number of students that happen to have a height between, let's say, 1.2 and 1.3 meters, right? So the advantage of this type of distribution, it's often said to be normalized, the advantage of this distribution is that the area under this curve is going to equal unity because any student that we measure uh, has to fall in this uh, within this 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 range of heights, right? And if we sum up all the the, the fractional uh, probabilities uh, that a student has a height between uh, uh, let's say 1.4 and 1.5 meters, we sum all those up. We've got to get unity, right? We have to we have to get a, a unit number, and so this is referred to as a normalized uh, probability distribution. It's still a discrete distribution because it's binned, right? It's, it's, uh, it's got finite, it's got bins of finite width, right? And you see this all the time at Purdue, right? If you, if you ever look at, uh, let's say the distribution of exam scores, right? They, they tend to have this, this type of uh, look to them. Uh, we want to actually uh, move beyond that, this concept, okay? And we want to ask the question, well, what happens if we want a finer distribution? What happens if we want to make these bin widths, which in this example are a tenth of a meter, that's 10 centimeters. What happens if we want to uh, uh, make the bin width smaller and smaller so that we can maybe measure the average height of a Purdue student to a millimeter, right? How, how do we go about doing that? Well, 
what we basically have to do is we have to take the, uh, the, the fractional number of students in a given bin width and we have to redistribute those number of students into bins of ever smaller uh, uh, width. So we have to conceptually decrease the width of these bands, right, and redistribute the numbers that occur in this uh, large bin uh, into these smaller bins. Now the problem when you do that is um, the uh, entire distribution becomes flatter, it gets compressed, right, because the total number uh, that has to be, that has to lie between 1.6 and 1.7 meters, that total number has to be the same, but uh, the bin widths are much smaller now, and so uh, the, uh, the actual value uh, or the actual height of a given bin decreases. And what's even worse is the shape of the, the, the distribution can start to change in weird ways, right? It, it, it can get distorted. And um, so what, what we need to do is we need to define something called a probability density. And the, and the way we define that probability density is we take the fraction of the students in a given bin and divide it by the width of that bin, delta H, right? So as we make the, the bins smaller and smaller, um, the, the fraction of students in each bin decreases, but delta H is also decreasing, and this probability density, P of H, uh, 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 remains roughly the same. So what ends up happening is this, when you, when you go through this process, what ends up happening is you now have a continuous uh, probability distribution. It's referred to as a density because we're dividing by uh, some parameter, delta H in this case, right? Uh, that, that gives the, 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 the idea of a, a probability density. And the virtue of this uh, process is that now uh, if we take this probability density and we multiply it by some width, or some height, delta H, what we're going to do then is we're going to get the fractional number of students um, uh, with a height between H and H plus DH, right? So that's, that's what the ultimate uh, goal of the calculation is. So, you know, if you tell me what DH is, some, some number over here, DH is, let's say, a tenth of a meter, and I uh, estimate what the average value of the probability density is in this region of the curve, I can then quickly estimate the fractional number of students which has a height at Purdue between, let's say, 2 and 2.1 meters. Okay, so that's the idea of a probability density. And it's very useful because once you know the functional form of that probability density, P of H, then you can start to do uh, detailed numerical calculations. And so, for instance, I just, just try to represent that here. Uh, uh, since P of H is a continuous function of H, uh, we no longer do sums, we do integrals. The integral has limits, and you have to be able to determine what those limits are. So, in this case, our limits of integration are going to be from a height of zero to a, to a very large height, which we can conveniently approximate as infinity. And, uh, and if we want to measure, let's say, the average height of a student, we just put in that height h. We integrate the probability density p of h uh, over all possible ranges of heights. And then we got to divide by some normalization factor, right, which is just p of h dh. And when we do this calculation, we then get this average value uh, based on repeated measurements of the average height of a, of a student at Purdue. And the notation for that is H bar, or sometimes it's this bracketed, this, uh, this angle bracket uh, H, right? There's different textbooks use different ways to represent this, uh, this, this uh, average expected mean height, okay? Now, if the probability density is properly normalized, then the area under the curve is going to be equal to unity. And then this simple uh, uh, calculation for the average height just reduces down to the evaluation of one integral, right? Uh, 
So that uh, tries to explain why it's important to normalize uh, probability distributions up front, because once they're normalized, the denominator in this calculation can be then just uh, replaced by the constant uh, one. So if you've understood that discussion, and I hope, hope it's easier to understand because you can directly relate to it, uh, then you can apply a similar logic to uh, 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 probabilities in quantum mechanics. So, uh, again, recall that the probability density in quantum mechanics is just psi star times psi, so that replaces this probability capital P uh, that, that we had in the previous discussion. And if we happen to know uh, the wave functions of a quantum particle, and we want to know what the average position of that quantum particle is in one dimension. So we're just, right at this point in time, we're just focused on one-dimensional problems. Uh, right, so if our one dimension is, is designated by the parameter x, we want to know what the average value of x is for a particular problem. What we'd have to end up doing is evaluating an integral that looks at a very, very similar to the uh, integrals that we um, just discussed when we were dis when we were thinking about the height distribution of students at Purdue, if the um, area, if the wave functions are normalized, then then this integral is guaranteed to be equal to unity, and we're then left with a simple uh, expression that has to be evaluated. It, it requires psi star psi, which is this probability density. We multiply a probability density by a, 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 a length dx, and that's the fractional probability that the particle will be in that range uh, of x. And then we multiply that by the actual value of x and some overall possible values of x. So, you know, when you set these integrals up, you've got to be able to think your way through these, these, uh, these issues, right? Uh, so it's not, not only do you have to evaluate the integral, but you have to be able to set it up, which means you have to be able to identify the lower and upper limits, and that'll change depending on the quantum mechanical problem of interest. Um, you're going to have to define whether the uh, integration is going to be over one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions. That's something you've got to put into the problem if you want to calculate these uh, these uh, expectation values, these are referred to as expectation values for a particular parameter. Okay? So, uh, 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 the next lecture we're going to extend this, uh, we're going to assume that you understand this, this discussion of, of probability densities and, uh, and, and probability distributions. And we're going to start to uh, uh, define quantum mechanical operators and, and show you how to calculate the expectation values for those quantum operators. So uh, come back and, uh, and we'll extend this discussion in, um, in a number of important ways. Thank you much.